Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today's episode is a guest expert interview with Amanda Diekman. Amanda is uh, an expert in low demand parenting. I can't wait for you to learn about low demand parenting. But before we dive in and hear the conversation I had with Amanda, I would just love to ask you to help us support the show by sharing the podcast with friends or sharing it in your favorite social media channel and also by rating and reviewing the podcast. This really helps us to reach more people. Word of mouth is a great way to, you know, we we all listen to the people that say, hey, you've got to listen to this, this great podcast. And so if you could rate and rate us on Apple and Spotify, super easy. Leave us a review on Apple would be fantastic. We would just really appreciate that support. It takes a lot of work and time and energy to put this together every week. And the more people we can reach, the more worth it it is in terms of just knowing that we're helping people and growing our community. So if you could please share the show, rate us on Apple and Spotify, leave us a review on Apple would super appreciate it. I'd love to share a review that I got from one of our listeners, Beth, who's also a member in our Peaceful Parenting membership. You also might remember Beth from the podcast. She was on the podcast talking about uh, the challenges she was finding in parenting her daughter, Sophie. So she emailed me a little while ago and she said, Sarah, I'm having some huge breakthroughs, less with Sophie and her self-regulation, but more with my reaction to her and her meltdowns. I've been tracking it on the three-month calendar for almost six weeks and it's so reassuring to see how well she does some days. She looks for me to be the calm amongst her storm and I'm able to do it because of stop, drop, and breathe. She's having a hard time, not giving me a hard time. She's doing the very best she can in this moment and so many other lessons you have taught me. Thank you. I just love that and I love that Beth knows that the key here really is her, right? So let's celebrate Beth. Really well done, Beth. And you know, this... This is a long game. We talk about this, and I love how she is looking at her successes in terms of how she's managing not changing her child's behavior. So I just love that. Thanks for sharing that, Beth. And I would love to hear from you. So hop over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a review, and let's meet Amanda. Without further ado, we, as I've mentioned, we are talking about low demand parenting. Low demand parenting, she's going to explain what it is. And it's really especially effective for parents who are just having a lot of trouble getting through the day. I know that is so many of you. I heard from so many of you in our Complex Child Summit. And Amanda was actually one of our summit guests as well. And I just know that there are so many of you out there who are just working so hard and every day still feels like a struggle. So you really might want to tune in to checking out low demand parenting. Let's meet Amanda. Amanda Diekman is an autistic adult, parent coach, and author in the neurodiversity space. Amanda became a leading voice in the movement for low demand parenting practices with her book, Low Demand Parenting. Amanda runs a successful coaching practice for parents of neurodivergent children, including online courses and a vibrant membership community. She lives with her husband and three neurodivergent children in an intentional community in Durham, North Carolina. I hope you love this episode as much as I love talking to Amanda each and every time I speak with her. Hey, Amanda, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Awesome. Hi, I'm Amanda Diekman. I live in Durham, North Carolina with my husband and three kids who are still young. My oldest is 10, my youngest is six, and then my middle is eight years old. And they are all neurodivergent. I am autistic and I 
began teaching and sharing as a parent coach online about a year ago when I came out of a season of really intense burnout for my middle son and a diagnosis for me of PTSD from my experience of parenting. And I realized through the process that there was this new way of parenting that was so radically turning my life upside down and also giving me joy and ease and freedom in ways that I never had before. And I didn't see other people talking about this way of parenting. And so both as a part of my healing journey to share about what I'd been through and out of a a real desire to shape and change the narrative around parenting, I began to share online. And so low demand parenting is the approach and you can find me online as low demand Amanda. I like how how your name kind of rhymes, not quite a rhyme, but (laughs) it rhymes a little bit. Yeah, low demand Amanda. (laughs) So low demand parenting, and you have a book coming out, or that actually by the time that this podcast hits the airwaves, your book called, it's called Low Demand Parenting, right? Will be out so people can get that wherever their favorite place to get books is, I assume. Yes, that's right. There'll be both an audio version for all of us who love to listen more than read, Kindle and and print. And you, yeah, you can find it in all the places. It's a short readable book for people who are in the pit, in the very bottom. I I wanted it to be something that I could have picked up when I was at my most burned out and exhausted, and that would have given me the information and the tools and the compassion and understanding that I couldn't find anywhere. Mm-hmm. So in a way, it's, it's kind of written to me at my, at my bottom. Yeah. And so for you, if you're at your bottom, you can trust this is not going to be over your head. It it will meet you where you are. That's so great. Okay. I think first tell us what is low demand parenting and then do you mind sharing your story? I mean, it's a really powerful story. And so maybe to start with what is low demand parenting and then how you came to adopt it. Absolutely. I mean, they're so interwoven. So yes, I will, I will tell both pieces. So low demand parenting radically reverses the way that most traditional parenting approaches the the relationship between parent and child. So in low demand, we are going to align our expectations to right where our child is. We're going to let go of all of the things that are too hard, proactively, intentionally, on purpose, with a whole heart, and then start right where they are in terms of building a trusting relationship going forward, because really that relationship of acceptance and trust is the fertile ground that helps us to grow into whatever will be. And it's a parenting practice. So it's not something that it's not a one size fits all approach. It's not a lot about scripting or even about particular techniques. It's much more about the way that this particular child needs to be parented in this particular moment. So it's about seeing, respecting, and loving the child that you have, not the child that you wish you had, which can be a grief process for many parents to realize that, man, this journey isn't what I thought it was going to be. This is not the kind of parent I thought I was going to be. And also it can be a reparenting journey for many of us who experienced a type of parenting when we were little that it has lasting scars. And it can really be about healing some of those messages that we heard or told ourselves when we were very little around we are okay just as we are. Even though we don't, you know, I don't call peaceful parenting. It's not the same as low demand parenting. There's so many overlaps in terms of what you just said and, you know, really having it be focused on the needs of your particular child. And my community tends to be people who have kids who are in the more challenging end of children, which is why they're looking for, you know, a new approach and and often come away from conventional parenting to peaceful parenting. And in fact, a few episodes ago, I had a panel of five parents talking about grief and the the grief that they have recognized and that this isn't what I thought it was going to be. So I love those overlaps with the, the community that you're already speaking to here. It will, will really be able to take this in, I think. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. I mean, has, I, that's a good segue into my journey and, and our story when, because so much of the low demand process has grown directly out of listening to my deeply struggling child 
because so much of the messages that I received when my kids started to go downhill and his behavior got more and more difficult to manage and the impact on our family environment became more chaotic and aggressive, so many of the messages that I received is that I was doing it wrong, that this was a parenting problem, and that if I just was a good enough parent, then my child wouldn't be struggling, and we would have that kind of dreamy, peaceful home that I saw so many other parents seeming to access without any difficulty at all. Mm -hmm. And so learning that I am a great parent, but that good parenting looks different than I was told. I redefine good parenting as seeing, respecting, and loving the child that you have. Yeah. And low demand grew out of seeing, respecting, and loving the child that I have. So my middle child has a diagnosis that is less known in the United States than in other parts of the world. But within the autism spectrum, there is something called pathological demand avoidance or PDA. And maybe your audience is beginning to hear about this more. As We've the talked about it a few spreading. times on yeah. the podcast. Yeah. And PDAers have a really difficult time with many of the ordinary demands of life. And so my pda -er was the same. From a really early age, he struggled with eating and sleeping, using the bathroom. And of those, those early markers of PDA can be that, that those kinds of things are really difficult. And then it became verbal speech and back and forth communication was really difficult. He had a really hard time self-soothing and managing any kinds of shifts in parental attention. He's a middle child, so we never had some fantasy world where he was the center of the attention. So things were always, always hard for him. But it really crescendoed when he got into school. And we, we were parenting through a pandemic, so school didn't even look anything like school might have before. We tried a number of different online settings and then fought for him to get into an in-person kindergarten, which he did for about a month. And then a day came when he did not want to go. And all of my old scripts told me that this was anxiety and that good parents push their kids through their anxiety to the other side so that they can learn that the anxiety is wrong and that they are strong enough to handle it. And so I did that. I said, I'm going to help you. I picked him up. I carried him to his kindergarten teacher. He was thrashing and screaming. And I passed him off into her arms and she bear hugged him. And I turned around and I walked away. And that day, something broke in me because nothing about that felt right to mm -hmm. me. It, in fact, it all felt wrong. Mm -hmm. And yet I was doing my 100% best, like with yeah. the old model that I was using. I was at the top. I did it calmly and respectfully and gently and mindfully, and it still felt deeply wrong. And when I picked him up that day, it turns out he had had a twin break to mine. Mm -hmm. He, His teacher said he had a good day. He got over it quickly. He's, he's all right. And we walked up to the car and he got in the car and he started screaming and he never came back mm. to me from then. Wow. He went into his room that day and locked the door and stopped speaking to me, stopped eating. He would no longer engage in any back and forth communication. The only way he would communicate to me was with this very huge behavior, screaming, kicking the door, throwing things. It was such a major moment in our lives. Mm -hmm. And what what I discovered because Again, like there was no other narrative for this other than a failure. Right. And yet I knew that wasn't true, mm -hmm. that something important was happening between us, some major shift. I named it a breakdown. It could also be called a breakthrough. Love that. And truly it was when my eyes were, were open, my ears were opened to really see and hear my child telling me this isn't working for me. He'd been yeah. telling me that for all the six years of his life and mm -hmm. I couldn't hear it until it got really big and really, really loud. And then I, I shifted everything and I said, okay, what if you're okay right here? What if you are good enough watching 12 hours of YouTube, eating pretzels and Nutella and screaming at me? What if you're still okay? Just mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. 
and that you don't need to do any more than right where your capacity is. And once I aligned with him at that place, at this kind of like deep, dark, scary, awful place Mm -hmm. and realized it wasn't deep, dark, scary or awful, we were just together Mm -hmm. in this place. Then we were able to build forward with a whole new outlook. And I realized I could let go of everything and he and rebuild completely around trust. And from then we discovered together what it looks like to let go of everything that's too hard And instead, like that's our main category distinction is what's hard and what's too hard. And when something is too hard, we let it go. And when something is just hard, then we're brave. We do our best. We ask for help. We make accommodations. And discovering what's what became this journey of of living out low demand life together. I love that. What a what a dramatic day that that sounds like. And and to be clear for anyone who's not familiar with masking, he was just masking the day at kindergarten. That's why the teacher thought he was fine because that could be confusing to people who aren't aware that kids can do that when they're actually in total distress that yes. they can appear fine on the outside. You know, it sounds like such a dramatic story in the way that I tell it because of the arc, because mm-hmm. of where it falls. But as I tell this story, I, f- I hear from hundreds of parents who say, I've done exactly that. You know, mm-hmm. I've I've forced my child yeah. into school dozens of times. Or it was really, in a way, it was his bravery to show up to me and say, this is not okay. Yeah. And, and I don't want this kind of parent and I don't want to be this kind of kid. It was his bravery to allow himself to express it in such a dramatic way that changed the whole arc, of course, and mine and my willingness to listen. You know, right. it was those two, it was us showing up to each other in that yeah. moment that made it different. I Yeah, I, I received that for sure. Can we talk a little bit about PDA before we go on? Because I think it's important for the listeners to understand the nervous system context of PDA because I I, I know what you're talking about, but I don't know if other people know what you're talking about. Cause, so can you just talk a little bit about what happens in the nervous system of a PDA or because I think that will give some context to your son's behavior, basically. Yeah, absolutely. So PDA is a nervous system disability. It essentially is a wiring that is like a child who's experienced trauma. So if you're used to a trauma-informed approach or perhaps you are an adoptive parent and so you've received a about kind of early attachment trauma and the way that can show up, it shows up similarly, except for PDAers, this is a baseline wiring. There is no kind of healing from it. This will be the wiring forever and for always. That said, brains are are flexible and neuroplasticity is real. So there are more adaptive ways of living with a highly, highly sensitive nervous system. And that is what low demand really aims to do is Mm -hmm. to surround this kind of hypersensitivity with as much support as possible. But on a baseline level, it means that when a PDA or encounters a, a threat, which demands like even saying something like, good morning, can be a threat or because it it is a demand for reciprocal speech. Mm-hmm. Eye contact can be a threat. All kinds of sensory experiences are threats and routines can be a threat. So just the expectation that something is going to happen. Excitement can be a threat because it's a demand on on the body to, to, to do a thing. So all kinds of things can be perceived as threats. And when the brain perceives them as threats, it immediately switches them into a fight or flight mode. And so it is a subconscious reaction to the reality of the demand, which is why low demand is proactive because once you've triggered that system, then it has to run its course. And that looks different in every kid. Now that my kid's nervous system is so much more supported and at ease, oftentimes he can move through the threat response cycle pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But when he was in burnout, you know, we could last for hours from a very, very small threat because he was at, at his capacity all the time. I've been thinking a lot about, in my community, I talk a lot about strong-willed kids, and I am myself a very strong-willed person, and I've been thinking about strong-willedness, strong, that the characteristic of being strong-willed is on that same continuum, I'm pretty sure, because I experience little, I have a very, I actually was, 
I think I'm, I'm lucky I have a very st- sturdy nervous system, but even I f- experience, if my husband tells me to do something that I was planning on doing that I want to do, if anyone tells me what to do, I experience that in my nervous system. Like I, I can manage it. I can manage it fine. I don't have a meltdown if he tells me, you know, tries to boss me around, but I think it's on the same continuum. Do you, have you ever thought about it that way? Yeah, I definitely do. I think that's one of the things that can get lost in the narrative about autism. So sometimes people will say things like, we're all on the spectrum somewhere. I find that a really unhelpful statement because it is people who are autistic are having a very different experience of the world in terms of the intensity of the experience. And then But that said, I think it's so helpful to realize that these are human traits yeah, and that we can deeply understand one another in in some really compassionate ways. Mm -hmm. So it's like we have to hold two truths. Like one truth is that these experiences can be deeply disabling and subconscious and that when your nervous system is feeling really fragile for any number of reasons, there is no ability to access your tools. And yes. that is a really terrifying experience. Yeah. And if, if you felt it in your body, you know, oh, I can imagine what this would feel like if I was feeling this on top of a fragile nervous system and not having tools right now. It totally. would be yeah. terrifying. Yes. And thank you for uh, clarifying that because I, I in no way meant to suggest that everyone's on the spectrum because I don't believe that either, you know, and I don't even like the, you know, the spectrum language. However, I do think because we all have nervous systems, we can understand that that the threat response and how it can, can get activated. We all experience that every day. However, most of us, as you said, have the resources, don't have the fragile nervous system and it doesn't it doesn't interfere with daily living for most people. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I have three kids and I use the same low demand parenting practices with all three. And only one am I sure is a PDA or I think there's one that's a possibility and we're still figuring it out. They're all neurodivergent, but My oldest is much more ADHD forward, and so he has a lot of things that are too hard for him, more because of attention focus shifts or because of time blindness or his difficulty managing some of his internal states. And so all of those things are also so super important to support Mm -hmm. with this approach. And my youngest has really significant anxiety and Tourette's. And so for him, he has these these ticks that cause him to do and say things that he doesn't mean and doesn't want. And so we really need to also support him. So there's so many reasons that we might show up. And I think having a strong-willed child is a, is a perfect lens for thinking about, so what is it that they're telling me is too hard mm-hmm. with this strong, like, I love also the like the more positive lens on that rather than like highly reactive or difficult or something like that. It's like, no, this is a child who is strong enough to show up to me and tell me clearly what's too hard. Some of our highly sensitive kids are much more inward and more shy Mm -hmm. and we might see their too hard showing up as like running to your room tears, shut down, like where the child is no longer present, Mm -hmm. a kind of low-key dissociation. And it's important to look for those things too, because sometimes those kids slide under the radar with their too hard because they don't make it hard for the adult. It's easy to think, oh, they're fine. Yeah. But they're really not fine. Mm -hmm. They're just not showing it in such a dramatic way. Mm -hmm. Totally. So we often hear about low demand parenting in the context of raising neurodivergent kids. And I think it also has, I think it's also good for everyone to think about low demand parenting because I, I think it really, you know, when I was reading your book, I was thinking about, yeah, I already really coach people to do a lot of this stuff. You know, when I, whenever we talk about limit setting, the first thing I think of, or that I talk to people about with limit setting is really look at your limits. Like why, you know, is this something that is really necessary for health or safety? That's my personal you know, if it's not going to hurt somebody else themselves or property, then fine, (laughs) you know? So, and I know even just with people who are 
you know, more, a little bit more, con- you know, they're doing peaceful parenting, but they're maybe a little bit more conventional. Even that is hard for people sometimes, right? Yes. Because they, they have their own ideas of how things should be or what's the better idea or no, you really need to do it this way, not that way. So let's push them even a little bit further. Okay. Mm-hmm. Will you do that with me? <laughs> yeah. Let's push them I'd a little bit to. further. It's kind of like my role in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Push people a little further. Yeah. So tell us about, let's, let's just define a demand. Okay. Give us some examples of a demand. A demand is anything that is too hard in the present moment. So that allows for demands to really fluctuate from one day to the next, one moment to the next. So some demands that we proactively drop in our family are verbal back and forth communication. We do a lot of nonverbal communication. So we have a lot of visuals. One of the nonverbal communication tools that we've used is a one through five scale for how much is in someone's battery pack. Basically, my kids are really technology oriented and they know what it takes to keep their devices charged. Mm -hmm. So at five, you're fully charged and at zero, you know, you're shutting down. And so we communicate back and forth with numbers. That's one of the ways that we're able to check in is I'll flash them a question mark sign with my hand and then they'll flash me back what number they're at. And People don't even think about how the ways that spoken language can be a demand because we're so oriented toward asking, hey, what's up? What's going on? Why are you acting like this? But even those questions can be perceived as unsafe by your child. And if your question is unsafe, then you can't trust the response. And mm-hmm. it breaks down trust between parent and child. It's Another also thing- a tr- it's also a trigger for parents that that demand, right? Like if you're if you ask your kid a question and they don't answer you or if they're upset and they're not quote using their words, that can be a real trigger for parents too, right? Which increases that the the disconnection. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, because parents are often interpreting the lack of response through a particular lens. Oh, they, they're not being respectful of me. It often will set off a whole fear-based, like, well, if we can't even talk about this, then I might as well. You know, they're trying so hard to do peaceful parenting. Mm-hmm. And then they ask this really nice, gentle, peaceful question, like, you know, tell me why you yeah. did that. <laughs> and the world throws something in their face. And they think, well, I might as well just ground them. You know, right. why yeah, am I yeah. totally. And Instead of recognizing, oh, maybe that question was even too much, no matter how calmly or gently I stated it, the fact that I asked a question is too much. Mm -hmm. So we work on declarative language, which instead of asking a question is using fact-based statements that don't require any kind of response. And so even in our nonverbal communication, sometimes there's a back and forth element. So even noticing, man, I am putting something out there and with my energy, I'm expecting them to reciprocate in some way. Putting your arms out for a hug can be a demand or holding your hand up for a high five because it's expecting some kind of action in response. And again, it can be so triggering for an adult to put your arms out for a hug and and to be rejected in that moment, essentially. Mm-hmm. It can bring up all, all kinds of, of early childhood trauma. So we and that's where the self-compassion in. comes in. Yes, exactly. All bringing demands all the way down to that baseline level of like any kind of back and forth interaction with your child. But it can go all the way up to things like transitions can be really demand laden. So moving from one activity to another, something like brushing teeth or for young kids, diaper changes, and for older kids, like hanging up your backpack after school, these can be really significant demands in daily life that cause so many battles that are moments where parents find it especially hard to maintain connection. And if they're, if they're trying to, to be calm, Mm -hmm. I actually find that the demand to remain calm is, is a really significant demand for me. And so that's one that I proactively drop. Are Not you a, that I are allow you a PDAer? I am a PDAer. Mm-hmm. Yes. So telling myself I need to be calm makes it less likely that I will be right. calm. <laughs> <laughs> so instead I tell myself whatever comes up in this moment is okay. And it doesn't mean that it's okay that I, you know, what actions I take with it, but like allowing myself full autonomy in my internal emotional space is Mm -hmm. really important part of my own self-love practice. What This is a little bit of a tangent, but it's something I'm super curious about. So there are a lot of adults in, you know, the last few years who have, like yourself, who have realized later in life that you're autistic 
And there are a lot of kids who are today being diagnosed or assessed as autistic who are being assessed or diagnosed because of challenges, right? That like that this led you, the challenges that you were experiencing with your, especially your middle son led you to an assessment and a diagnosis. However, you as a child did not stand out if I can, if I can just, you know, say a general statement like that. And I think that is a super common story. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you have any, if you've reflected about what changes in our culture or what changes in something has must have changed for kids to be standing up and as you have said like being strong about their needs that mm -hmm. was different however many years ago when you were a kid because your story is not unique in a lot yes. of ways no, do you do you understand right. the question i'm trying to get at yeah i do i think it's it's two i've got two thoughts coming up one is that nobody knew to look for the signs in those days. So my mom has said over and over again, like, if we knew you were autistic back then, it would have been bad for you mm -hmm. because the path that would have been laid out of what we should do as parents would have been so destructive. Yeah. So there's that. My parents did notice that I was different and all of my teachers, like my mom is, has said she has this whole file of letters that she would get from people about me because they were just like, this child is so different and usually coded good, special, you know, wonderful, that kind of thing. But they didn't see some of the challenges that I had at home maintaining that specialness all the time. Also, often for girls, the pre- puberty years are sort of similar to mine. There's kind of a specialness, a uniqueness. Then when the social demands ramp up is often when autistic traits and behaviors come out much more strongly. So I, I experienced a good deal of social shaming and my masking took on a whole nother level around 12, 13 through probably early college years. It took for me to kind of like find my solid ground again. So those are all kind of more backward looking things that I, and that, but that's true today too, that autistic girls are much more likely to be identified in middle school than they are in childhood, mm -hmm. which I think has more to do with the assumptions that we make about what's appropriate behaviors for girls. And at different ages. I think that today, some of the reason that we're seeing kids identified earlier is that we know what to look for because of the sea change that's happened around neurodiversity and the incredible advocacy of autistic adults in order to change the narrative and the autism establishment. I also think that we're seeing PDAers in particular, but but I think autistic ch kids writ large are rising up and bringing their voices to bear on the nature of childhood today. And mm -hmm. they are saying, we need more aut autonomy. We need more freedom. We need more control that we, we are worthy of being trusted and that there is something happening in parenting today where kids are experiencing a lot of control from their parents and that that being controlled to this level and to this degree isn't healthy and good for their for their childhood and for their selfhood and their development. And some of our children are really strongly pushing back against that. And that looks like all kinds of difficult behaviors. But at its core, I think they're the canary in the coal mine. They're mm -hmm. saying something is wrong with the relationship between parents and children today around the issue of control. And that if we're going to really honor that kids are deserving of trust and that they deserve autonomy, then we need to make some big changes. Interesting, because I was sort of wondering if it was the opposite almost of what you said, that that kids today, that there's that adultism is like a little bit, if we can say, and that kids feel they have more freedom to push back. And instead of masking and fawning, they're like, pushing back a little bit more. I mean, I guess it could be both. I, I think it's both. both yeah, I think it's both. There's enough safety because mm -hmm. of adultism weakening and an adult's knowing what to look for. And the there's enough safety there for kids to use their voices in a way that, you know, in the 80s, there was not. Yeah. There was no category for a yeah. child standing up to their parent. Yeah. And 
and yet there is still that considerable amount of control that adults are wielding over their children that that requires the response. That's true. So it's kind and of both. I also have to remember that I'm in a bubble <laughs> in terms of like the adultism <laughs> waning probably, right? Like there's still plenty of people out there who are practicing authoritarian parenting and not at all interested in what we're talking about, but they're not listening to this podcast. But they're podcast. not our people. <laughs> no. I actually got a one-star review like on my podcast of like all five-star reviews and I have one one star review that's actually hilarious i don't know why they were listening to the podcast because they said this podcast is so woke it's hurting my ears <laughs> something like that congratulations i know <laughs> that's so funny right <laughs> like why are you listening to this podcast anyways okay so i have a i have a question about low demand parenting and dropping the demands. And I'm going to use, a, I, I don't think my client will mind because I'm going to use an example that we were grappling with in a session. She has, she has four kids and her second child, who's five, has recently been diagnosed as autistic. And I don't know if he's PDA or not. I suspect that he might be, but I don't even know if where they live there, that's in the in the mix of of being looked at. And she's really struggling with something you struggled with that you talk about in your book, which is a hungry kid who won't eat because they're experiencing it as a demand, right? And so we were trying to break that down. So just for people who don't understand that context, can you explain how a hungry kid may, a hungry kid who's, you know, needs low demand parenting might experience that as a demand and just set the stage and then I'll ask you her specific question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So hunger is an internal demand, kind of have four primary internal demands and they are dysregulating to everyone. If you think about how you feel when you're hungry and like your brain kind of goes offline a little bit, that's true for everyone. But for those who are particularly demand sensitive, it will create a full panic response. So the fact that your body is getting hungry produces panic. And over time, that codes in particular brain pathways where even thinking about eating can produce a panic response, which makes it really hard even when your kid isn't hungry and you just want to talk to them about what they might want to eat can can produce panic. Okay, so she we were um, talking about possible solutions for for this and she said that he likes hot savory food and that if she can like, you know, cheese quesadillas, like that's like because we were saying maybe because I I recognize that her offering him choices, he was experiencing that as a demand. So I said maybe we could have like a a drawer where there's a whole bunch of food in there and that would lessen the demand that he could just go and look in the drawer and find something that he liked to eat that was in the drawer. And she said, yeah, but the problem is he'll want something hot and savory. And she has a baby and a two-year-old and also, you know, an older child. And she said, I can't, I just can't make a cheese quesadilla at the drop of a hat. And she really, she wasn't being like, she wasn't, you know, sometimes parents, I think, just feel overwhelmed in there trying to resist the solution. I think in her case, it's probably not possible. Like, I think it's just, Mm. she probably can't. It's not a won't, it's a can't, right? Yes. And so what I'm thinking, and I've had this come up before with parents, and I actually heard you on your summit, I heard you talking about this. What do you do when dropping the demand for the child makes more of a demand on the parent? Yeah. Really, you're just not there yet. You haven't found the durable, wholehearted demand drop that works for your particular family. It can still, sometimes for some seasons, it can be better to drop the demand for the child and increase the demand for the adult if the adult can handle it. It can be like, it can be too much but you can find a way to support it in some other ways by letting go of other things. So it could be that you can make the cheese quesadilla if you had a good hands-free solution for the baby and if the toddler wouldn't get into anything. So then you can be thinking, okay, how can I make those, how can I support those places so that I can drop the demand for this kid? And that's where you have to be aligned with with your deep why for this particular season. So it's possible to say in this season, meeting my five-year-old's need to have a cheese quesadilla at any time of day is actually top priority. Because when the five-year-old is dysregulated, they're likely to, to be aggressive with the younger kids. That's exactly Safety what was going is my on, top right? Priority. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So I would rather have my toddler be crying because they're bored than have them be hurt. Mm -hmm. And so I will create 
an enclosed place where I can plot my two-year-old. I'll make sure I maybe I'll proactively wear my baby carrier at all times so that I can plop the baby in there. I will move, I'll, I'll move the quesadillas um, shells to the closest place by the microwave. You know, you drop every element that might make it too hard for the parent so that you can make do it. Mm -hmm. So that's one path is figure out not just this is too hard for me, but exactly why is it too hard for you? What are all of the core elements and how can you drop those proactively while holding the quesadilla demand? Yes. Or you drop the quesadilla demand. I cannot make a quesadilla for you at all times of day. So what can I do to make eating possible without the demand of the quesadilla? Hmm, maybe, Maybe I could drop my expectation that food be as healthy because maybe my kid is actually also fine with Cheetos at any time of day. You know what? That's and- funny what we did, what I suggested to her when, and it seemed like the cheese quesadilla was too hard. I said, you know, maybe we could just go for the savory and why don't you buy some of those little like cheese and salami packages? And she had to drop the demand that she not use extra packaging and processed food, but she thought she could live with that. And she thought maybe the little packages of cheese and salami that she could hand him when she couldn't make a cheese quesadilla might work. Yes. Right. Or you get one of those tiny little refrigerators and keep it in his room so that he has cheese and salami, you know, assuming, I mean, assuming and now that my child is in burnout and can't leave their room, but assuming your child can leave their room, we bought a mini fridge because for one of my kids being able to physically get his own food is really important that having to ask for it is a demand and and involving an adult threatens his autonomy but he can't reach to oh, yeah. where the refrigerator is so we needed to bring the refrigerator to him so we dropped the demand that he would go get a stool because we found that that was too hard in the moment when he was hungry so it's really about your particular child and where you can flex mm-hmm. like if are you flexible enough to 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 get a mini fridge are you flexible to drop the packaging demand and and even asking yourself well is there are there companies that use recycled pla- packaging that I can feel good about? Mm-hmm. Like sometimes we need to use paper plates, but we are able to get compostable ones. And so that still fits within our comfort zone. We need to use paper plates because it's too much of a demand on both my partner and I to do the dishes in certain seasons. And so we're able to drop that in a way that still aligns with our deep why. Talk some more. I was just going to ask you about the deep why. So talk some more about the deep why. I mean, in your book, you talk about the the demand comes from an expectation, right? Mm -hmm. And the expectation is usually there because of a uh, the why. So just talk about discovering the why. Absolutely. So demands are are three layers. I have found that there's the surface level demand, which is like, come sit at the table right now. It's dinner time. Then there's the expectation underneath it. And that is your positive imagination for why this particular demand matters. So come to the table right now because you respect me enough to respond when I call or because, you know, my, your dad's almost home from work and this is our only family time of the day or whatever the reason is. You've got a reason for issuing the demand. But a layer beneath that is your adult need. And that is where the money's at. If you're going to dig, dig to the expectation and then ask yourself, why does that expectation matter? Where does that come from? Well, it comes because I am so stressed and scattered all the time. And the only time I feel like a good mom is when we're all sitting around the table together. Or I know that my partner is going to be mad if if they're, if we're not all sitting down and he's going to yell at you, which hurts me because we're not aligned on our parenting practice. And I don't want you to get yelled at. So please come to the table. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this need that is lurking beneath and the need leads us to our deep why. So our deep why is twofold. One is it's naming your season. It's saying what really matters right now? What matters most? It's like saying the cheese quesadilla matters most because keeping you regulated so that you're not being aggressive with your siblings is top priority for our family. And that is so grounding when you have to let things go you never thought you would let go. Mm -hmm. You know, you thought you could hold it all and it could all matter and it would all be okay. And some seasons it's not. And Mm -hmm. you got to know what matters most. And the other piece of it is how you apply it to the present moment. And so that's what positive thing am I teaching my child in this present moment by letting this go? It's saying, 
not like I'm letting something go again. You know, I'm showing them that I'm weak or I don't have good boundaries. I don't have good limits. That's a lot of what we say to ourselves when we drop things. And so instead it's turning that around and saying, you can trust that I will always listen to you saying that when you tell me something, even when that's through big behavior, I will listen and respond with love and kindness or that I will, I will support you through your hard seasons, no matter what you do. And we can so imagine how those kinds of things help our kids grow into sturdy, stable adults who know no matter what I throw at my parent, they can handle it. So let's say I'm at a party and I'm a teenager and things are happening that make me feel unsafe. I know I can call my parent and say, come pick me up Mm -hmm. because they trust that no matter what they bring to you, you will put their, your connection first. I, and I was just, you keep, you keep ending your sentences with the next question I'm about to ask you. It's so <laughs> perfect. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what I'm hearing is that this is sort of, in a, in a lot of ways, this is peaceful parenting times a million, because when we, in peaceful parenting, we always talk about connection is the most important thing, right? Like I'm, I'm currently running a, a, a group for peaceful parenting in the teen years. And the first, the, my first class is all about how you have to constantly ask yourself, is this worth the strain on the relationship? Because mm-hmm. connection is the most important thing, right? And it's important. That's of course important at every age, but especially for teenagers or especially for maybe our kids who have these challenges with their nervous system, right? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a friend who says, is the juice worth the squeeze? Yeah. And I love that expression. It It's a pragmatic look at, let's say it's bath time and you would love to just run the water and have your kid get in the bath, have a fun time and get out. Mm-hmm. Like, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> but for some of our kids, that's not the reality. Yeah. So it's going to be splashing everywhere, at the, which then is going to make you frustrated and you have to clean it up. Or maybe they're going to scream the entire time and it's going to be so hands-on that your other kids are getting into God knows what while you're hands-on with this kid. Or they can get in fine, but getting them out is going to be so difficult that it's going to push bedtime off. So it's so hard for parents sometimes to look at that honestly and say, okay, it's a choice between no bath and maybe, maybe no bath for weeks. I don't know. Your kid may get really dirty Mm -hmm. (laughs) and not clean. But it's the choice between that and this real bathing experience. And is that worth it? Mm -hmm. There is no fantasy where they just get in and get out and it's all fine. That doesn't exist for you right now. Yeah. And And so often we live in that as if that were true. Well, and I think that you're – so Corey, who works with me, she's one of my coaches. I said, oh, you're going to find Amanda's book so validating (laughs) for your experience. (laughs) And so I think so many of the parents in my community are going to also feel the same way because as I was reading your book and you talk about reading all of the book, all of the parenting books and just coming away with this feeling of like, I'm doing all of these things and it's the outcome is not what it's supposed to be, quote, supposed to be. And I hear people in my community saying the same thing, you know, and I, I, one thing that we say all the time is you can be doing all the right things in quotes and still be struggling. Because you, your kids are not those kids that are, that are going to just, there's, there's not, it, because you're struggling, it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I had this whole list of like good parents do blank. Good eat dinner together and eat yeah. dinner together, bathe their kids every night, read books all snugly in their pajamas. Good parents sign their kids up for well-rounded activities. Good parents can show up for a birthday party on time, like all yeah. kinds of yeah. things. And just totally reorienting that around that good parenting is seeing, respecting, and loving the child you have. Yes. Full stop. None of that other stuff matters. It is not a marker. And so it, it is not the measure of good parenting is not whether your child can get in and get out of the bathtub calmly and peacefully. That's just not it. Mm-hmm. And so we, and we do so much hiding because of the shame that we feel. We do so much hiding the places that we kind of like cut corners or mess up. Like pe- people come to me all the time and say like, I don't have any screen time limits, but I don't tell anybody because I'm so deeply ashamed or my kid hasn't brushed their teeth in two weeks. And 
they're dropping the demands that they need to Mm -hmm. in order to align with their struggling child, but they're feeling deeply ashamed about it. Mm -hmm. And part of what I do is help people interrogate the shame and fight back against the shame and instead stand tall and say, I, for me, the marker of good parenthood is that my kid hasn't brushed their teeth in two weeks. That is me being a good parent. And and it's it's the same. We talk about parenting in public and, you know, when your kid's having a meltdown and you're worried about what everybody else is thinking about you in the grocery store. And I always say to parents, like, just ask yourself, who's my loyalty to here? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same question that you probably, you know, come back to. Like Mm -hmm. who's, who matters the most here? My kid's well-being or what other people think or what good quote, good parenting is supposed to look like. Yeah. And as I do this more and more and, and more and more publicly, you know, if somebody wants to check out how I do low demand parenting every Friday, I do a low demand day in the life where I share all the things that I do. And and that that involves sharing you know, really, really publicly to the whole wide internet, all the things that we drop and all the ways that I align with my kids and what their struggles look like. And, and then I parent in public in real life. Mm-hmm. And I find that the number of negative comments that I get truly pale in comparison to the number of positive ones that That's people great. can really tell that this looks different mm-hmm. and that boy is my kid struggling and boy am I staying connected to them even when it looks really different than what the world says I should be doing in those moments. So I just want to share that message that like I could see people thinking, man, I bet Amanda gets so much hate mail for all the things that she does. And I really honestly don't. That's great. Can I, I've got one more question and well, actually, yeah. and then, then we'll start to wrap up. So how is, I, I saw another, and that mom that I was telling you about, I sent her an art, I looked for an article on low demand parenting and found one. And it was, I don't know the author, but they said something like, this is not the same as permissive parenting. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Like, what is the difference in your mind between permissive parenting and low demand parenting? Or is there a difference? Maybe you disagree that there's a difference, even though permissive has gotten, you know, has a a negative association. Yeah, I both think that permissive parenting should not have the negative association that it has. I think that our fear of being permissive is causing us to do all kinds of boundary holding that's not really aligned with our child or even ourselves. I, I found that I would hold boundaries like, you know, if you don't hold on to the shopping cart, I'm going to turn around and leave right now. It's like, <laughs> I don't want to leave right now. And it actually doesn't matter if you hold on to the shopping cart. But I was so worried that if I didn't, if I said that, if I said you need to hold the shopping cart and then they didn't do it and I didn't respond with some kind of limit setting or boundary, then they would like their safe sense of safety would go down because I was so convinced that kids only feel safe with boundaries and limits. And it, it led me to do all kinds of wild things. So I think that our fear of being permissive is is not helpful. Mm-hmm. That said, I think that the kind of permissive parenting that is that is hurtful that I would dis- recommend dis- against, wish from, yeah, <laughs> yeah, is is actually probably a kind of dissociative parenting, where the parent's nervous system is so overwhelmed, and or their internal mental health state is is so depleted that they are not connected to their child. And so they are saying whatever is easiest in the present moment in order to lower their own stress level and get out of the present moment. Right. That is permissive that I think we really want to steer against. And honestly, that can happen. What I see is that people waffle between more authoritarian authoritarian or, or even like strong gentle parenting techniques and that kind of dissociative parenting because mm-hmm. it's so hard to stay connected all the time that mm-hmm. then you get locked into your phone and you're watching a video and you're like, whatever. Okay, sure. Go get that thing, mm-hmm. which is not, is totally different than like saying yes with your whole heart. So maybe it's that, maybe it's the intention and thoughtfulness behind the two things that make them different. Permissive. I think you're right. Permissive versus low demand parenting. It's like a consciousness of what, what are we letting go of rather than I'm just letting go of things because it's, because I can't handle it. Yes. Yeah. You hit it in the alarm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I would love to keep talking to you all day, but I'm sure you have other things to do and I have to go to the dentist. So so I want to close by asking you two questions. The first question is where can people find out more about you and what you do? I think you've, I think you've said a little bit, but just give us a, we'll put these in the show notes as well. 
Yeah, the main place that I show up every day is on Instagram at Low Demand Amanda. And I would truly love it if somebody listened to this podcast and took something away or had a lingering question and you reached out to me over DM, I always reply. Great. So please do. Okay. So that's an open invitation. Also, you can find me on my website, amandadiekman.com, where there are tons of articles and and links to free resources that I have, especially one I want to highlight. I've created a quiz called Why Are Things So Hard? And it helps to point to maybe some of the places that you are, are trying really, really hard and it's still not working, like we were talking about earlier. You know, you're doing all the things that the book tells you to do, and it's still so difficult and kind of getting into some of the nuance of why that might be and a next step. So I'd love for you to take that free quiz and and see if there's a next step for you. Awesome. And okay, my final question is a question I ask all my guests, which is if you could get in our little time machine, go back in time to when you were a new parent, what advice would you give yourself? I would say to ask the question, what if I could trust this? That is my magic question for all all my parenting moments. What if I could trust this? It says, what if I could trust myself? What if I could trust this connection? What if I could trust this child? I wish that I could go back and trust my chit kids more Mm -hmm. from the start. I love that. And that's what we talk in Peaceful Parenting about choosing radical love. And I think that's a very similar thing. Like what if you could, what if you could trust that you can operate from a place of love instead of a place of fear? We talk about that a lot. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.